So Bill, why don't we start with you? And I know that you have written and spoken uh, extensively on how to demystify big data because it is a pretty intimidating subject. What can you tell us, Bill? First off, organizations do not need a big data strategy. What you need is a business strategy that incorporates big data. And while that may sound like a play on words, in reality, making that flip has all the impact in the world on focusing your big data initiatives around those things that are most important. For most organizations, they don't fail at big data because of lack of opportunities. They fail because they have too many. There are four things that big data can do for you. Just four things. Number one, it provides access to all, the complete history of all your transactional and operational data at the level of the individual. Number two, it provides access to this growing wealth of unstructured data that's out there, both unstructured data you have inside your organizations, like comments that are coming off of salesforce.com, or, or email conversations, or notes. Number three, right time analysis. That is the ability to analyze and catch your customers in the act of doing something, to know that they're doing something, that they're at a certain place, they're buying certain products, they've made certain comments. And number four is how these data scientists are gonna leverage all this wealth of data to leverage predictive analytics and machine learning and cognitive computing to look across this wealth of data to simply find things in the data that are unusual. Data science is about identifying those variables and metrics that might be better predictors of performance. Frank, in, in your work at Salesforce and previously at Apple, I know that you focus on how to get started. So what we've been focused on and experimenting with and ha have had some success uh, with is taking that insight, finding the consumer of the insight, in our case it would be a salesperson, and then inserting that data within their sales motion that has existed for thousands of years, selling is selling, uh, without being disruptive, instead aiding that process. Liz, if we could maybe even shift directions here a little bit, what's your view as it relates to big data and the opportunity that exists for companies uh, in, in the future of the workforce? In uh, 2015, the data market and big data market was around $32 billion. The projections are that this will uh, creep up to about $53.4 billion by next year. In addition to that tremendous growth, so correspondingly, we need to think about the talent that each and every one of you need in your organizations. Some of the work that McKinsey recently did indicated that there's going to be a shortfall and there is an existing shortfall in the number of people that are produced that have this deep analytical skill that Bill and Frank have talked about at some level. But more importantly, uh, McKinsey predicts that by 2018, uh, we're going to need 1.5 more million uh, individuals who fall into what this, what's called this analyst uh, category. Uh, in other words, people who really understand not how to build the algorithm, so, but how to take the, the data itself and make a knowledgeable action. Brian, let's go to you. How do we sort of reconcile the role that big data plays in an environment that's so relationship driven? I was on the phone with my parents and I gave my parents a Kindle Fire two years ago and I bought them an Amazon Prime subscription. And the Kindle Fire after two years gave up the ghost. Not a very well-made product. Um, so my dad got on the phone with Amazon and he called the rep and the rep didn't speak good English and there was not a lot of communication there. And uh, my, my, my father eventually got frustrated because they wouldn't replace uh, the fire. And he not only uh, uh, said he wasn't gonna do business with them anymore, but he canceled his Prime subscription because he didn't understand the, that they were different products. So Amazon could have turned that into a positive sales interaction by providing a discount on the new fire and retaining the business they had with Prime. But they didn't. And when you look at what some of these data-driven companies like Amazon are doing, they're missing the opportunity for that human engagement because they're too driven by the data, mm -hmm. right? So we're starting to talk at Forrester about this idea of post-digital. And what post-digital means 
is it means that, yeah, big data, analytics, mobile, uh, engaging compelling experiences using digital technology is table stakes. But what's really important in the post-digital phase is not driving that down somebody's throat with automated decision making and big data analytics, but it's about bringing all of that insight into the human engagement and the human interactions and bringing those back in. What are some of the characteristics of organizations that have been the most successful as it relates to leveraging big data to really impact their businesses? Big data is not about big. Big data is about small. Yep. Mm -hmm. Big data is about getting down to the level of the individual. Right. Think not, not internet of everything, think internet of one. And better yet, think about internet of me. And so when you start focusing at that level of the individual, it does become much more actionable. I can start delivering insights and recommendations right. being very prescriptive about what somebody should be doing at your point of customer engagement. What do I see in organizations who are successful? There's, there's, there's um, three things and one consequence. Number one, I see organizations that are successful with big data, number one, have a fanatical focus on the business. They know it's about delivering insights, prescriptive recommendations at the point of customer engagement. Number two, they know how to prioritize and focus. I said earlier, you, you will not fail because of lack of opportunities. You'll fail because you have too many. And so you've got to pick and focus. And don't worry, by the way, if it's not the perfect one. Pick one and get started. Number three, the killer. You have to have an environment of collaboration between the business and IT. The companies we see be more successful with big data aren't the big enterprises. It's the small organizations where the business and IT people are, can work together around a business initiative. The successes we are having are more times than not in that marketplace. For yeah. those smaller companies in the audience, do, do they actually have an advantage? Oh yeah. I envy anybody in a sub 500 person company uh, in the room. The ability to get things done and move quickly, uh, you just don't have that in, in large organizations. And if your processes are bad, you're just going to have bad data faster. And in the big data revolution, you're going to have bad data prettier. And that's really it. So the ones that say the, the technology is merely a tool to complete the task, and they have that task which is no different than any task that we were trying to do 30 years ago. They have that thing in mind and they're just using this as another tool, like Bill said, to get this thing done. Those are the ones that are in it for the right reasons versus, it's important to talk about the opposite, people that are drunk on these like spinning uh, pie charts and cool demos and they buy it and then they think that learning that technology is going to a, a, a magically make some business process yeah. happen. It doesn't happen that way. It happens the other way. What advice would you all have for us in terms of how we should begin the journey and what path we need to get on in order to empower them and enable their success? Stitch Fix is a beautiful example. So what Stitch Fix does is, as you know, they have, you have a personal style consultant that ships you clothing periodically. Right. And it's the same person, so they get to know what you like by what you decide to keep from the shipping and what you decide to ship back. But what they do is sometimes a style consultant will get a recommendation from an algorithms and say, here's the five things that Mary wants. And sometimes the style consultant will go, well, I know Mary won't like this thing. I'm going to put another thing in the box. Right. So what they do is their back end process, ask the style consultant, what do you know? Why did you do that? Well, because I know Mary likes this style and this wide belt. She'll really, she loves this with this kind of pants. Well, that knowledge is captured from the style consultant, goes back to the algorithm team. The algorithm team says, what can I learn about this new piece of uh, clothing that I didn't know before because now I captured some insight from my employees? And that gets baked back into the algorithm. As you think about the bigger topic and the opportunity that we have as direct selling companies, what are the things that come to mind for you that you would point us in the direction of or encourage us to think through further? You know, it is a new frontier from a strategy standpoint. The analytics piece of this needs to become part of the framework that you use uh, when you think about charting the course forward for your organization. I would argue that the analytics and the data um, are really not a substitute for making decisions, uh, which people have really identified here, but should be an automatic part of your toolbox 
going forward. And if it isn't, just like the technology that's been identified, then, you know, you should be cautious. Please join me in thanking our panel on a terrific discussion.